and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I am Martin Willis, your host. We don't have Alejandro Rojas with us this week. Um, You know why? Because uh, he and I recorded a full hour of news, and that's on uh, openminds.tv. Or you can listen right on our website, which is podcastufo.com. Right in our show notes, we have an MP3 player, and it's an entire hour of news. So no news for this show. The first hour, we have uh, Gerard Artson coming up. Now, Gerard lives in Amsterdam, so I had to do a pre-record. But don't fear, I will be in the chat room while this is going on live. And the book that Gerard wrote was Here to Help, UFOs and the Space Brothers. And a lot of that's based on contactees, and we have, I would say, an interesting discussion about that and some of the contactees' thoughts and theories. Well, about three-quarters of the way in, hour one, we have Grant Cameron coming on. Grant will be uh, at the Experience to Speak coming up in a few weeks, and he has written a book recently, Alien Bedtime Stories. i got to talk to him about that. We're going to be talking about Wilbert Smith and more, and that will go into uh, the last part of Hour 1 and into Hour 2. Now, we have a lot of new live listeners. I want to welcome you. And that's all due to Art Bell being back And because of that, I'm getting a ton of email, and I encourage email. And anyone can write me at martin at podcastufo.com. It's kind of funny. Some email comes to me saying they don't like a certain thing that I do. Like, in other words, they don't like the fact that I let guests talk, you know, about what they want to talk about. I don't steer them. And then I have similar emails coming in saying they like that because I don't do that. But everyone has their own style. If you listen to any shows here on the Dark Matter Digital Network, there's some great shows here, and you'll hear everybody has their own style. And we're, I'm definitely not Art Bell. I think he's the best. Again, Alejandro's not on, and he is on vacation next week, so you won't hear him next week either. But I want to thank everyone that supports the show. Now, if you're not listening live and you want to listen to the podcast, All you have to do is go to podcastufo.com on the sidebar. You'll see you can support the show for only a dollar per month or more to listen to the entire show. The first hour is always free. And, you know, you get a special link that will go into any media player, and it's a cinch to set up an iPhone as well. Now, again, if you're listening live or if you're listening at all, I appreciate every single one of you. So I've done enough blabbering, and uh, we are ready to get started with our first guest, Gerard Artson. Again, this is pre-recorded, but no fears. I will be in the chat room. And here we go. I am recording um, to Amsterdam, actually, right now, with Gerard Artsen. How are you, Gerard? I'm very well. Thank you, Martin. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, you have a book with uh, actually an amazing title, um, and I was really looking forward to speak, speaking to you. And it's Here to Help, UFOs and, space, and the Space Brothers. First of all, I would like to uh, ask you to share your uh, reason for getting interested in this topic to begin with. I don't care if it goes all the way back to childhood. Um, well, it does go back a fair, fairly long way. Um, the, my background is that of a student of the ACES wisdom teaching. 
And the Age of Wisdom teaching is the teaching that have been given um, since 1875 by people such as uh, Helena Blavatsky uh, from the Theosophical Society. Alice Ann Bailey uh, in the early 19th century, the first half of the 19th century, uh, sorry, 20th century, and later uh, Benjamin Graham. And my, I, I, I had been reading uh, George Adamski's books at a fairly young age, around 18 or 19, and lots of Eric von Däniken's books. But uh, much later in life, I discovered a direct connection between the the, the, the stories, the information coming from the early contactees and these wisdom teachings uh, in the form of George Adamski's first book, Wisdom of the Teachings of the, Wisdom of the Masters of the Far East, which he published in 1936. So that was well before his first uh, uh, book about uh, flying saucers. So that's where, that's where my interest in the subject comes from. And and uh, I, my first uh, publication was a book about George Adamski, A Herald for the Space Brothers. And um, since writing that, I think I did it in 2010, um, I came across so much more information from so many other uh, of the early contactees that chime in with, uh, chimes in with these teachings that are culminating in this time in you know in the crisis that we see in the world and the changes that we need in the world uh, that i decided to write uh, here to help ufos and the space brothers wow now we have a, a regular listener i'm sure he's going to be listening to this um that actually met uh george Ademsky and a few other of the uh, uh the other george uh, van Tassel, I want to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, um, he says that they actually admitted directly to him that they were uh, making this stuff up. Have you ever heard that? Um, I've heard it before, and um, uh, I think uh, you know some of the contactees may have uh, made uh, statements uh, to that effect um, when you know f- for whatever reason. But uh, I've uh, done so much research, and I've uh, seen so many accounts, including um, the research from a fellow author from the UK, Timothy Good. I don't know if you're familiar oh, yeah. with his work. I've met, I've met uh, Timothy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ah uh-huh, yes, and um, in his book, I believe it's called, it's the one called Alien Base. He also writes that uh, there's um, actually this was just before the millennium, the change of the millennium. Um, he wrote that at this time, you know, much of George Adamski's information is even more relevant than it was uh, back in the 50s. Um, so uh, you know, I have no doubt that uh, what uh, George Adamski had been lecturing on, writing about, speaking about, is exactly what he wanted to convey to the world and what he was asked to uh, to tell the world. All right. So basically, the the premise is is that um, you believe that the the uh, contact that has been made here has really been set forth into actually helping us because I I breeze through your book, unfortunately, as uh, most of my listeners know I've been uh, very busy in the last uh, several months. Um, I had, wasn't able to read through through your book totally, but I did skim through it. And the premise is, is that uh, we're being contacted and being guided along, uh, so not to basically destroy ourselves. We we are run on greed, um, all that. Can you kind of explain where this is going? Uh, yes, um, and, and correct uh, indeed. Uh, you know the the, the uh, people from space, the visitors from space, that contacted dozens of people around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world in the 1950s, and, and uh, since then the contacts are still continuing. Um, have done so in order to f- inform humanity to. Um, that we need to change our ways. You know, our, our economic system, our financial system, our societies are based on, on, yeah, a missing piece of information, uh, or rather, uh, uh, some ignorance in in terms of the spiritual realities of life. They 
have come to tell us, listen, you are one human race. You all depend on, on, the, depend on the same planet. And you need to get together. You need to cooperate to solve the problems that you ex- experience at this time in order to survive as, as a race, uh, as brothers and sisters of the same race. And they offered their help to governments, which was uh, declined. Uh, there's uh, uh, several accounts in that respect about uh, um, space people contacting um, the United States government, for, for instance, and offering um, technology and help, etc., as long as we would um, uh, abandon uh, nuclear Technology. Uh, similar accounts have come from um, from Italy, from people involved in the uh, in the friendship case. Um, and um, you know, so when those those uh, high level contacts were declined, um, in terms of of um, you know overcoming uh, the antagonisms between the United States and the Soviet Union at the time, um, they continued their individual contacts around the world to still get the basic information out. And my book, uh, in my book, I've tried to show that so much of the information from the different contactees corroborates these, you know, their, their, their different stories, their, their various stories. Of course, there's this, the variations in details, etc. Uh, but we are always dealing with, you know, with individual people from different backgrounds, different upbringings, different cultures. Um, and one will be religious, perhaps. Another will be more mystically inclined or more scientifically, more academically inclined. Uh, so there will be those differences. Um, but it's amazing to see the amount of information that is shared among them. And even more uh, surprising to see, or perhaps not so surprising if you're a student of the wisdom teachings, that of the amount of information that they have shared and that co that coincides with uh, the teachings of the Asia's Wisdom teaching about the, the oneness of, of humanity and the need for uh, international cooperation uh, to tackle global problems and uh, you know, creating uh, a system based on sharing and justice rather than competition and greed in order to, to build a, a, a sane and a just society for everyone, not just for people who can afford to buy their freedom or, uh, or their justice. Well, you know, this actually kind of goes along with a lot of the things you hear, that uh, people who uh, claim they've, uh, you know, had an abduction experience of some kind or another, they've seen, you know, visions of, of a, wor- a world destroying itself, and this is what is going to happen if we don't stop doing this all the way to uh, Zimbabwe when there was the 65 school children. Um, yes. You know, all these accounts of people kind of saying along the lines that we have to take care of the planet and uh, also the strong connection with nukes and uh, mm-hmm. uh, all the incidents that have happened with that. So, you know, I understand, it. you know, it just seems like there's just too many things uh, of, of similar cases happening with, with just disregarding this as nothing. One of the things I wanted to ask you, have you spoken with anyone today, like someone that is claiming they're having an abduction experiences and uh, what, what they're hearing from? I haven't spoken to um, um, any, anyone who claims to have been abducted. I, um, um, you know, the, the the whole abduction narrative, in my mind, is um, um, yeah, is unfortunate, um, and it only arose after the the uh, the early contactees in the 1950s, because you don't find stories of abduction among the the early contactees uh, when they were getting uh, so much attention, especially George Adamski. Um, for their information and their their uh, message of hope and, and brotherhood, um, that's when this this disinformation campaign um, 
apparently started. And that's when you begin to hear stories of abductions uh, towards the uh, the end of the 1950s and especially in the 1960s. And now it's it's a, a common part of uh, of the whole UFO um, uh, the whole UFO phenomenon. It seems. Um, I personally think that it is, uh, and I and I understand there's many people who uh, claim to have been abducted, and that it's an ongoing experience uh, for for many. Um, I believe that either they are not taken against their uh, wishes. Um, and they've just come to call it abduction because it has been such a you know household term uh, since uh, since the 1960s or uh, they have been having their experiences and the experiences are real but are not connected to any uh, activity from uh, by the space people but rather by um, uh, secret agents uh, whose job it is to um, um, to disqualify, to ridicule, to instill fear of the um, extraterrestrial presence, um, or you know some people, and then let's be real about it, some people just have a very active imagination and they they think these things are happening to them. So there's various explanations uh, for the abduction um, narrative, uh, and I think. I think it is very telling and, and uh, very um, um, significant that you do not find stories of abductions until um, the uh, information coming from the contactees started to worry the authorities uh, because of uh, their immense popularity. Right, and they did. They had a, a, a great number of followers um, back then. Now. Mm. There is another thing that you hear a lot. I, I've heard this repeated many times, and I'm not sure where it originated from, but that the there was a deal made with the U.S. government as far as uh, abductions or hybrids or whatever it is in exchange uh, for their technology. Have you looked into that claim at all? I've come across it, and I think it's nonsense. So it's not about the the, the evolution of, of humanity. It's not strictly about the evolution of the form, our form having evolved out of the animal kingdom and uh, the animal kingdom having evolved out of the vegetable kingdom and the vegetable kingdom out of the mineral kingdom. Those are vehicles for the uh, expression of uh, consciousness, uh, expression of life through the evolution of consciousness and you know this evolution takes place throughout the universe scientists are still thinking that earth is lucky in a way in that the chemical balance of elements was conducive to life coming into existence here but there is no part in the universe where there is no life um, it's not um, it's not always visible to our eyes, but um, if you uh, if you've studied the the wisdom teachings, you will know that life doesn't depend on dense physical forms for its expression. Uh, above the three physical planes of existence, the dense physical and the uh, uh, liquid physical and the gaseous physical, there are four higher. Uh, levels of uh, physical reality called the uh, etheric planes of matter and these have been um, discovered uh, by Wilhelm Reich for instance the uh, Austrian uh, physician who had to escape the Nazis and came to, uh, to the United States only to be locked up by the FBI in the 1950s uh, he discovered organ, what he called organ, and which is basically those four higher planes of matter, uh, which elude our range of vision, but uh, they're uh, they're real nonetheless. And it's on those higher planes of matter where life on the other planets takes place. So, um, the you know what we're dealing with is um, extraterrestrial life that hasn't evolved to our point of evolution yet and extraterrestrial life that has gone ahead of our point in evolution. Um, Earth apparently 
according to both the uh, the space people that visit us and and uh, the originators of the wisdom teachings uh, which are humanity's elder brothers who have evolved out of the human kingdom as i said you know it's uh, an evolution of consciousness so it doesn't stop at the human kingdom uh, these are saying that earth is in a particularly uh, tricky point uh, at a particularly tricky, tricky point of its own evolution as a planet and therefore we are being protected. There are the most other planets apparently have the ability to travel space even if they're not entirely uh, you know, advanced as, as much as we have. Um, but uh, so there have been uh, this is to say that there have been visits from, from uh, people with less um, you know, uh, lofty uh, intentions. But uh, for quite a while now, we have been protected by the uh, people from the higher planets who are more highly evolved than we are. And there is no way that, uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrials would have come here and, and struck a deal with the U.S. government or any other government um, to, uh, uh, to come and, and abduct people. Also, why, would the, why on earth would people who have the, uh, you know, who have evolved to the point that they can travel, they have the technology that they can travel across space from planet to planet, or many people claim they come from outside our solar system, why would they be so backward in biology? Why would they need to, and then, you know, you get the stories because it gets wilder and wilder. You get the stories of hybrid races and they're dying out and they need to, it, it's, I think it's a fantasy. And, and again, it's, uh, it's probably also part misinformation or disinformation uh, to um, discredit the, uh, the extraterrestrial presence. Well, um, one of the things I, I think about every now and then is, okay, say we are, being visited and we're being cared for, uh, there's probably millions or even billions of planets out there in the universe that host intelligent life. You know, I mean, I'm only speculating. There's no way to know for mm -hmm. sure. But just in that speculation, why would we be special? Why would, why would we be protected? What's your opinion on that? Um, we are special in the same sense that every race on every planet, humanity throughout universe is, is, the universe is special. We are a certain clearinghouse in terms of the evolution of consciousness where the, uh, you know, and this is getting a bit technical in the esoteric sense, the, um, the consciousness of life finds self-consciousness. And, and, you know, this is all part of an enormous plan of, of evolution for the planet, for the solar system, for the galaxy um, that perhaps we don't have uh, time for today. Um, and it will also perhaps uh, be outside the, uh, the uh, topic of, of uh, you know, UFOs, etc., but we are not that special. In fact, you know, we've been messing up quite a bit on this planet. But because we're in such a delicate situation at the moment, we are being protected because these people from the other planets, and it is my understanding based on my research and my study of the teachings, um, that uh, we are visited only by people from the neighboring planets in this solar system, um, because they see us as brothers and sisters. And they, you know, take the, uh, the, uh, uh, the teachings from the, the great humanity's great teachers seriously because they go through, they've gone through the same evolution. Uh, they see themselves as their brother's keeper. So they come here to protect us so that we can make this transition uh, safely into uh, a new age, a cosmic age. You may have heard of the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And that's just a, a well, a term... Um, you know, to indicate that the solar system is uh, is making this movement along the heavens, uh, and and every 2,150 years, it it uh, aligns with uh, the next constellation in the zodiac. And uh, for the coming 2,150 years, more or less, that will be the constellation of Aquarius. And each of these constellations have uh, a different energetic effect. And also, every 
age, every cosmic age, is inaugurated by a, a new teacher. You know, we um, we all, and, and I'm going back to the wisdom teachings again, and, and that's why, uh, you know, this is a very important part of that connection with the field of ufology and the extraterrestrial presence, in fact. Um, if you look back in history, uh, you will see that every religion has come out of uh, a certain set of teachings that was given to humanity by a great teacher. Uh, and it's not that the teachers came to found religions and, and, and create followers. Um, that's what humans did with the teachings that they received, with the understanding that they had at the time, or maybe their motives uh, to uh, to gain power over their fellow uh, humans. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about uh, Krishna, we're talking about Buddha, we're talking about Hermes and Hercules, and we're talking about Jesus or the Christ as the inaugurator of, of the, uh, the previous age, the age of Pisces, and this age too will be inaugurated by uh, a teacher. And we also know that you know one of the, the the traits that all religions share is that they all expect a new teacher. Christians are waiting for the second coming. The Buddhists, Buddhists are waiting for the fifth Buddha, Maitreya Buddha. Um, the uh, Hindus are waiting for the tenth incarnation of their god Vishnu. Uh, some parts of uh, Islam are uh, expecting uh, the twelfth Mahdi, the Imam Mahdi. The Jews, of course, are, are still waiting for the Messiah. So it's a very universal concept, and in, in the teachings, it's called the doctrine of the coming one. And the coming one this time, the teacher for the new age, comes at a time when humanity is making a breakthrough. I mean, we can see it around us. Um, it's not just a matter of technology, but the world is coming together at a level uh, that is, you know, that we haven't seen before, at least not in, in uh, history as far as we know it. There's a long part of history that, uh, that has gone unrecorded, uh, at least by our historians. Um, but the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the teacher uh, is going to inaugurate um, an, uh, the new age and um, the age's wisdom teachings since 1875, given since 1875, have been have been given to humanity to prepare us for this this time when we will be. Yeah, making this transition into, you know, some people call it an ascension, and there's all kinds of fanciful words, uh, but what it comes down to is that we realize we are one human family, we have one planet that we are responsible for, and we have to clean up our mess if we want to survive, and we have to overcome our differences, uh, which doesn't mean that we have to all start believing the same thing or saying the same things, because we have our different cultural backgrounds, etc., but we need to overcome our differences in order, you know, with, through respect for our differences, to create unity in diversity. And that will be the only way to create uh, a, a planet where everyone can live uh, uh, you know, a fruitful life, uh, developing the talents and, and, and everything, as long as everyone um, is ensured, is guaranteed the basic needs for, uh, you know, for life, uh, adequate food, housing, education, health care. Those things need to be provided for everyone, not just for people who can afford it in, in rich countries, but but across the world, around the world. And that will be the first step once, because um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I keep going on because okay. these things, um, these things are all uh, interrelated. What are we seeing in the world now? We see massive crises, not just on the, on the environmental front. Uh, look at the financial system. Look at the economic system. Uh, look at education. Look at our societies. You know, Third things world countries, are countries, uh, people starving. You know, have been starving for decades. Mm. And and what do we see now? We see the rich countries. America's building a wall in in Mexico. Maybe they finished it already. Um, there's the Mediterranean um, in in Europe, but dividing Europe uh, and Africa. But you know, people are taking to rickety boats and risking their lives mm. every by the thousands every day. You know, and many hundreds every week uh, die, uh, drown. 
because they're trying to get to a place where they've been told it's they will have at least have a chance uh, for you know future prospects. And the same thing is going on in the, you know on the other side of the world in uh, Australia, where many uh, refugees from Asian countries uh, are trying to uh, to find a better life for themselves and their families. Um, there's no. There's no way back. You know, we have to, we're trying to continue in the old ways of, you know, well, competition is good and um, the more wealth you create, the better it is. And, um, you know, everybody needs to, to work uh, for their, for their keep, etc. cetera. Um, but if we don't create a level playing field, because the, the playing field since 1945, since Bretton Woods has been skewed, to favor the rich countries and especially the wealthy people in the rich countries. And in America now, you know, and, and increasingly also in, um, in Europe, uh, to favor the large corporations, you know, and our civil liberties are at stake. So all these things converge to, uh, to make us aware that you know we can't go on in the old ways, and uh, we will. I, I believe, based on you know what economists are saying now and, and analysts, that we're we're about to um, experience a final crash of of the systems uh, that are now crumbling financially, economically, etc. And that will bring us back, humanity as a whole will bring us back to our senses, and uh, that will sort of show our readiness or pave the way for the teacher for the new age to step forward and to show us, you know, there's hope. It's not the end of the world that the old systems are gone because they were based on on the notions from the previous age and a new age is starting. Um, and he will, you know, he's not going to, no one is coming to rescue us. The world teacher isn't, and, and the masters of wisdom aren't coming to rescue us or to save us. Uh, neither are the extraterrestrials. They're all here in support of humanity that needs to get come to its senses and start to make a decision to you know start to cooperate, create justice for everyone uh, through sharing the world's resources, the world's food, the world's technology and knowledge and everything. Yes, well, you know, I I, I totally agree with the premise of all this that it is totally needed uh for you know to save humanity and 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 what we're possibly going through but i want to i want to step back a little bit to uh, something i just heard you say a little while ago there and that is um from different planets in the solar system now i know the contactees admitted that but there's pretty strong scientific evidence that there's no way that any of our planets other than earth in our solar system can support life so I guess I would like to hear what your thoughts are on that. Are you still sticking to the contactees, Venusian, and, you know, all that stuff? Or are you agreeing that it's impossible for life to exist there? On the contrary. Um, one of the things I said was that um, life doesn't need, it doesn't depend on a dense physical form to express itself. So on our planet, um, and I understand that Earth is the only planet in our system where life expresses through dense physical forms, plants and animals and, and humans, etc. The, the same things we can find on other planets on the higher planes of, of matter, the etheric uh, planes of matter. Um, I mentioned Wilhelm Reich earlier. He discovered orgon. And um, as I said, uh, Orgon is really his amalgamated name for the four higher levels of, of matter, etheric matter. Um, Semyon Kurlian developed a technology with which he could photograph the, um, the light, the energy fields around living tissue, uh, living organisms, etc., uh, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, a contemporary British biologist, I believe, uh, has uh, put forward the hypothesis of uh, morphogenetic fields. Um, and more importantly, most importantly, science itself has admitted and has been struggling since the 1930s 
um, with the fact that 96%, no less, the 96% of the known universe cannot be measured, registered, seen by us, by our scientific minds and, and instruments, etc. You're talking about so, like dark, dark matter and dark energy? Well, that's what the science is, has called it. Yes. You know, but mm -hmm. in all, it's 96% that they cannot, <laughs> that they cannot trace. Uh, so there must be something going on. And if you take uh, these, uh, you know, these various uh, scientists, um, Rupert Sheldrake, um, uh, Wilhelm Reich, they, they were solid scientists in their fields, biologist and, and uh, uh, um, physician, uh, medical doctor. Uh, Semyon Kurlian, and there was someone else uh, the, whose name I forget now, and, and achievements. Uh, but if you put those things together, you know, they have a very strong case, the, or let's say the, the, the teachings, the Ages Wisdom teachings, which um, opposes, which suggests the existence of higher planes of matter. There's a very strong case for that if, if you look at those things. Even last year in June, there was a newspaper report. Let me see if I can uh, um, accurately uh, summarize it that stated that um, astrophysicists uh, have found that there is more light apparently around the universe that they can account for from known sources. So there's another strong hint. You know, so I think there's every reason to believe that those higher planes of matter, those etheric planes of matter which elude our vision, our, our field of, of our range of vision, um, are real, and that is where life on the other planets takes place. It also uh, conveniently, I think, explains or provides an explanation of how it's possible that flying saucers, UFOs, uh, uh, extraterrestrial craft manages to drop into our range of vision or drop out of it, you know, in, a, in an instant, in less than an instant. And I put to you that uh, that is because they, uh, you know, being... Uh, be existing on, on, on one of the, um, or several of the higher planes of matter, the etheric matter, um, are able to, in their craft, to flick a switch and, and lower the rate of vibration of the, the atoms of which their craft and their bodies uh, is made up uh, so that we can see it and flick the switch back if, uh, you know, when they... Uh, uh, when they've had enough or they've, when they've uh, got the attention of the people that they wanted to get the attention from and, and disappear before our eyes. So, you know, these are all interrelated aspects of uh, the extraterrestrial presence. Um, and, you know, it explains a lot to me. And it also ties in with the notion of the evolution of consciousness. You know, okay, and, and so just a, just a couple of uh, questions. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to be stuck on this planet thing a little bit. Uh, first of all, sure. it, it, so why would a higher plane of matter or uh, life even want to stay on a planet like Venus? Why would, they, why would they need a planet at all? And why would they travel in a flying saucer, say? Um, and why would they have a body form if they wanted and not wanted We are so used to thinking in, in dense physical stuff. Um, and we don't, we don't, uh, and because of that, you know, it's quite understandable. We're not familiar with the idea that forms also exist on in higher vibrations on the etheric planes of matter. Some people go go out and say it's different dimensions, etc. I, I I wouldn't use that term. Um, and and if I can just add that, you know, it's very similar to our H2O water. Uh, the, the, when the molecules of water um, start to vibrate at a lower frequency, it becomes solid and it becomes ice. When they begin to vibrate at a higher frequency than, than the liquid form, it becomes vapor. Yeah? So you have three different states of the same molecule. And the same apparently goes for, for atoms that our bodies are built of. Why do they, you know, why do they live on a planet? Because uh, life at our stage, the human stage, and, and all the stages below us, from the mineral upwards, and, and above us, the spiritual uh, stage, you know, it, it evolves on planets. 
Uh, why on planets? Well, I know I can't look into the mind of the creator, uh, but that's uh, apparently that's the universal plan. You know, we see planets all over the galaxy and, and, and in other galaxy, uh, galaxies, apparently. Um, why do they uh, need to travel in spacecraft? Well, a lot of the work that they do here, that they come to do here, requires instruments and technology that they need their spacecraft for. For instance, the mopping up of the toxins and the, especially the radioactive waste that we uh, spew out into the atmosphere through nuclear tests and nuclear power stations, which is very, very debil debilitating for, um, for the human constitution. Um, so, you know, that's what they, for a very large part of their work, uh, come in UFOs for. And at the same time, it is only the people who have uh, gone ahead of the human stage in terms of evolution. Here on Earth, we call them masters of wisdom. George Adamski wrote about masters from Venus and Saturn that he met. Uh, only at that stage is it possible to, you know, to move, to travel by thought and, and, and position yourself on another planet. Uh, so, you know, that's something that's beyond our understanding and our grasp. Uh, uh, but there are a lot of people who have not reached that advanced stage of evolution yet, also on other planets, who still come either as tourists, as visitors, or to work and live here for some time. And, and um, a lot also, you know, of the uh, uh, UFO activity that we see is, is uh, in, uh, with regard to the cleaning up of our atmosphere and keeping our planet habitable in the current circumstances. I know you're saying this is uh, like a higher form of matter, but what would I'm still I'm still having a hard time here with uh, uh, with why something would be attracted to an uninhabitable planet and uh, mm. what type of evidence could possibly ever show that there is actually some type of form on planets. <clears throat> Yes, it's funny because you see it as an uninhabitable planet, like Venus or Mars or whatever. It's uninhabitable at our rate of vibration, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure because I haven't been there. But, you know, science tells us that for, for bodies and forms, the physical forms uh, that... Uh, you know, that we are familiar with, the human, human beings, um, Venus and Mars and the other planets are uninhabitable. But at the etheric uh, planes of existence, so they are higher than the, the gaseous uh, uh, level, um, you know, circumstances may be completely different. We don't know because we can't even see science here doesn't even recognize the etheric planes of matter on our planets. You know, and the forms that we maybe I should I should try and I could try and explain it like this: the forms that we see, you know, your body, the desk that you sit at, the the plants that you see around you when you look outside, they are actually the precipitation of the blueprints on the etheric levels, which is where uh, the uh, the hypothesis of morphogenetic fields comes in from uh, uh, um, Rupert Sheldrake. And um, so our planet is the exception in the solar system in that, you know, the physical expression has, has come down to this very low frequency. On the other planets, they have the same etheric planes where these same forms exist, except it hasn't uh, precipitated to the same low frequency that we have here on Earth. I don't know if that explains it a bit more. Well, but on those levels, there's no there's no need for you know the oxygen that we have here or the um, the, the, the same chemical balance in the atmosphere and things like that. Well, I don't know if you're going to take this offensive or not, but I'm not buying any of this. I'm not. I can't agree. <laughs> I'm not offended at all. I'm not offended at okay. all, and you know, it's uh, it's something that. Um, I mean, if, if I don't know, you know, but I, to me it makes sense if not, if the science itself says that it can't account for 96% of the known universe. It just can't account for it. If there are scientists like Rupert Sheldrake and Wilhelm Reich who come up with hypotheses 
you know that that they begin to give an explanation or, or um, yeah for for those for that 96 percent of missing whatever it is matter or then I think it's a, it's you know it's a serious contender what what the ages wisdom teachings say in terms of the etheric planes of matter. And, uh, yeah, Semi Akurlian has developed this uh, photographic technology to, to record energy fields that we don't see with our physical eyes. So, you know, I, don't, I, I personally don't mind if anybody buys it or not. You know, I, I'm putting it forward as uh, what my research and my study has, uh, has, uh, has taught me. So, no, I do understand that there are many levels out there that humans can't see can't uh, can't realize by like you're saying by vibrations by uh, spectrums of light. There's all kinds of things that we just can't see that could be actually around us. But one of the things you said uh, a little bit earlier, you were saying that uh, one of the reasons they needed their craft, their saucer or whatever it is coming into the uh, Earth's contact is mopping up our radioactive uh, mm-hmm. waste or something. And, and what, what yes. where did you get that from? What? How, um, th- that's information um, that comes from the uh, the person who has, uh, in my view, the latest installment of the most recent installment of the uh, um, the HS Wisdom teaching. I mentioned Madame Blavatsky. I mentioned Alice Bailey. Benjamin Cram um, has started uh, uh, talking about this subject and writing about it since 1974, 1975. His first book came out in 1979. He's also the person, um, an artist and uh, esotericist, future from the UK who has um, made it known that the, the, the world teacher for the new age uh, has been in the world since 1977 and is ready any time now once the crash happens to make himself known. Um, so, and, and he has, through his moment-to-moment contact with one of the masters of wisdom, um, also a lot of inside information, um, uh, inside knowledge about the purpose of the extraterrestrial presence on Earth. In fact, Benjamin Cram himself, he wrote a, a book uh, that mainly deals with this subject um, in 2010. It's called The Gathering of the Forces of Light. And it gives the the full esoteric perspective. Um, And in fact, in the 1950s, before he started uh, being trained for his uh, current mission, um, he was... uh, Excuse me. He was a contactee himself uh, for a brief period, and and talked about the spiritual mission of the flying saucers and the space people in in London, is uh, where he lived at the time and where he's still living. So that's uh, who the, he's the source for this information about the uh, the space people, uh, the, the the majority of the work of the space people here on Earth. So you think that there's people right space people right now here on earth are working absolutely yes all the time oh well let's hear about that how how and and what and what are they doing and um well um first of all I mean, obviously, I think, if you, if you go back to the old scriptures, not just the, the Old Testament, but also the old Indian scriptures and, and other scriptures um, from around the world, um, the, the extraterrestrial presence has been a fact for millennia. They've always been here. You know, because uh, everything is interconnected, uh, not just on this planet, but also in the solar system. Uh, it's just that we have lost touch not only with them, but through losing touch with ourselves and, and you know, with our real being, our true being, and, and with, uh, you know, the interconnectedness of, of uh, humanity as, as the one race on this planet, uh, we've lost contact with that reality of uh, the extraterrestrial presence. So the, the extraterrestrials have been all here all along, but especially since the um, discovery and invention of the uh, atom bomb in the, in the 1940s and, and the, um, yeah, the use of the atom bombs in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, they have taken up a major interest uh, because this is potentially a weapon that could not just destroy the planet, the Earth, but that destroying the Earth would have a major upsetting 
effect for you know the balance in the solar system. So obviously they're very much concerned uh, with that uh, with that capability, and and uh, they have been doing everything that they can to uh, help us get rid of it or to abandon it to 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 let go of it which we haven't so far all right well this has been very interesting to speak with you and the book again is called here to help ufos and the space brothers and um, i imagine you can find that on amazon and a bunch of other places absolutely right? yeah absolutely and yes. do you, gerard do you have a website uh, my website is bga publications.nl um, and uh, people, yeah, people can find um, you know my um, my shenanigans there, interviews or or talks. I'm coming to Loughlin in Nevada in November for a talk. I've been invited, and I'm currently working on a new book that I hope will be out in in October. And um, if I may just give a, a quick preview in that book, in my new book, I will bring together all the information I've been able to find from the contactees where they corroborate each other about how life on the other planets has been organized as sort of a show and tell or a, a, a teaching by example of, you know, alternatives for our modes of living. Very good. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. It was you a bet. pleasure. Okay, if all goes well during the music break right here, we'll be connecting to Grant Cameron. Hang in. Grant. Hello, Cameron. Yes. How are you? Just fine. Is this Martin? <laughs> it is. Yes, the one and only. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Welcome to the show. Wow. Uh, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, you were on quite a while ago, so uh, you're a new guest to us. Up now, people that listen to the Dark Matter uh, Digital Network, they heard you just what Monday night was it on Art Bell? On Monday night. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Grant, just to let you know, we're going to go for a little while here. We're, we take a one music break, and we're going to take that in about I don't know, maybe ten or fifteen minutes, something like that. Okay. And then and then we'll come back on. But it's not a music break where we we talk or anything like that. It's just a real quick break. Um, okay. So, uh, Grant, uh, I'd like to talk to you um, about different subjects, basically, than you spoke. Yep. on Art Bells, but there was a couple of things you wanted to address more that you thought about them, some questions that were asked of you. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, the one thing that, that uh, I really hadn't thought about too much was this uh, idea uh, about evil aliens. Uh, a lot of people, well, not, not a lot of people. It's actually, the figures actually show, of, there's a, a big poll that was done by the organization, the Edgar Mitchell Organization, 1,200 experiencers um, filled out this survey. And in Section 2, the question is actually asked of the experiencers. And the, the question is, do you believe the aliens are evil? And it's only 9.8%. Less than 10% of the people actually believe the, the aliens are evil. And these are the people that are involved in the whole thing. And one of the questions that come up during Art's um, show was a question about cattle mutilations. And uh, it didn't occur to me at the time, but um, basically cattle mutilations is something that's basically, it's not stopped, but it's pretty far down from what it was before. And this is one of the things I've, I've actually lectured on is what I call the alien pattern, that I've been in this since 1975. I've been in a long time. And I know that what happened in 1975 doesn't happen anymore, that basically we are almost like watching somebody turn the pages of a book, that this phenomenon is changing, is changing and changing. And cattle mutilations, when I started in 1975, were absolutely horrendous. They were all over the place. Uh, uh, there was ranchers with guns out in their field, uh, shooting at anything that was moving in the sky. There was huge numbers of cattle mutilations. It basically does not really happen anymore. Uh, I know of one case in Kansas City. It was either last year or the year before that, outside the Kansas City airport. Uh, there was just one. I was just looking on the news to see cattle mutilations. There was one in uh, June in Alberta, Canada, 
Uh, but basically, it doesn't happen anymore. And so the, this whole idea of cattle mutilations was raised, and it sort of indicates that, you know, these aliens may be evil. And so when I was thinking about it later, I, it occurred to me, um, if you actually look at it, I mean, if you are an alien and you can go through walls, and if you're an alien and you can, see, they seem to be able to go into the future, go into the past. They seem to be able to uh, appear as balls of light and turn into human beings or turn into physical beings. They have all this power to go through time and space. It doesn't. Occur, it doesn't uh, appear to me that an alien from the other side of the galaxy is going to decide to come across the galaxy mutilate a couple of cattle and then go back home again. I think the cattle mutilation thing is extremely complex as to what's going on here, what kind of message. I believe it's a message they're sending. And uh, even some of the latest postings, I, t- I just contacted Linda Howe. I haven't heard back from her. But Linda Howe is actually talking about the fact that it is 2013, that the complexity of the cattle mutilations has just increased exponentially in 2013, that some of these cows don't have brains and uh, there's stuff that there's no way you could account for it by saying this was predators or stuff like that. So the, the whole idea of evil aliens really isn't supported by the data and it's not supported by the experiencers themselves. This whole idea that there's some sort of evil force that's here to take over the world. And I even mentioned in some of my lectures, I I talk about the fact that if you actually look at the uh, experiencer data, which is what you have to look at, this uh, data from the people who are actually encountering the phenomena, not from somebody sitting on the sidelines, but the people who are actually there every night when this is happening to them, um, if you look at their reports, you actually see that there's very, very little actually physical about about aliens. Uh, you have a situation where they're telepathic. They can sort of uh, appear as balls of lights and turn into uh, beings. But if you take a look at some of the uh, the notions that are out there that the aliens are here to steal the planet, get our gold and stuff. If you look at aliens, there's almost nothing physical. For example, uh, if they're here to steal our gold, they don't have jewelry. Um, no, almost nobody. I don't think anybody's ever described jewelry. Uh, nobody describes clothes. So, I mean, if they're going to take over the planet, what are, what are they taking over? They really don't want anything on this planet because they don't have clothes and if they do have clothes on the experiencers will report that they're wearing uniforms and all the uniforms are the same uh they don't even have chairs there's a story i don't know if you've ever had brett oldham on uh no. he wrote the book called children of the grays uh he's one of the very interesting ones who had the download which i can talk about maybe in a minute the download about the uh the cancer cure he's given the cancer cure by the aliens and he talks about he's a big guy he's like six foot five six foot six he's big big tall guy and he talked about being forced to sit in the hallway on this little bench. And, and like, they don't have furniture. I mean, if you go onto an alien craft, I mean, you figure they would have, like, some nice uh, leather couches. They have nothing. Uh, Red Oldham was, yeah. yeah, he was forced to sit on this bench. And all the, all the furniture in the craft, we know from experiencers, actually is part of the craft. It, it's molded into the craft. So he's sitting on this little tiny bench that he can barely even sit on because it it's so small. And so there, you look at the, the aliens, they really have nothing of any sort of physical value. or uh, So that, that, again, indicates that their uh, role here is probably something that's not very physical. It's got something to do with something else, that they don't seem to be interested in physical material or, or doing uh, physical stuff. And so th- those are the kind of things that I was thinking about after um, I was on art show uh, that I think these are significant things that people should know when you when you look at the data. And uh, the data is actually very interesting when you start looking at the data uh, produced by the experiencers as to, um, you know, what interests them, this uh, idea that 35 percent of all experiencers have had near death experiences, which is very bizarre. Wow. For, for I never people. heard that. Wow. Yeah. Hey, hey, Grant, before I forget, yeah. I'm going to be meeting you fairly soon. Um, you're going yeah. to be at the Experience to Speak, and that's what? Uh, that's August, I'm sorry, August 28th, is it? Do you know the date? Yeah, it's the, no, I mean, it's the weekend of the uh, last weekend of August in Portland. Yeah, in Portland, and that, Maine. And that's, the, and that's the big Experiencer one. There's two sort of two real big Experiencer groups. Well, there's actually three. There's Zero, which is in Los Angeles. That's Yvonne Smith's group. And I've spoken to them. That's a fairly big experiencer support group. Uh, Then if you ever go to UFO Congress, which is in um, uh, Phoenix, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, they sort of started this experiencer uh, support group thing. And uh, when when we first went, it started, they have it first thing in the morning. 
because basically uh, the people, All right. it's a very sort of anonymous thing. So it starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I know as a lecturer, the last thing you want as a lecturer to be is the guy that's lecturing at 9 o'clock in the morning. Because everybody's up till uh, 3 o'clock in the morning talking to everybody. They're out at the bar or whatever. And nobody gets up for the first lecture. So if you're the first lecturer, you basically <laughs> don't have many people there. But the experiencer thing actually starts an hour before the first lecture. It's at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the, and the reason for that is they really don't want, people don't want to be seen uh, going to the experiencer event and it's in a back room and uh, they're up to like 150 pe- 150 people the last time i saw they have two rooms which are standing room only and you go in this room and there's people crying and they're very emotional about uh they've come from all over the country to tell their story because this is the first time they've they found a place where they've got uh support for their experience and the third event uh, that uh, audrey uh Hewen's putting on is this experience or speak conference in portland and she had this uh vision back a number of years ago to uh st- from this uh w- sort of the shining lady we sort of call it sort of a uh inside story that she had she had this uh event where she is basically told to start this group and this is the third big one and it happens in portland maine and it's basically a conference for experiencers and i'm honored that i'm going to be able to speak there and uh talk about uh, my experiencer group here in winnipeg and i'm going to talk about downloads because one of the figures that I think is very important that doesn't get enough attention is that most people may not know that of all the people who are experiencers who filled out these 1,200 people who filled out the survey, and not everybody answered every question, but of the people who answered the question, it's question number 53 in, in part number one. It says, have you ever, um, do you have anything in, in the nature of scientific, technical, or mathematical material in your head that you did not get from going to school or from any other means. And 43% of experiencers will say, yes, I got that. And their people are getting downloads, what I call downloads. The aliens, for some reason, are sticking highly advanced material in people's heads. People are sort of like these experiencers that are like going to school. They're learning all this kind of stuff. And uh, I, I, some of them are very dramatic. I had a woman, and unfortunately I missed her because uh, I lectured at uh, Contact in the Desert last month and i had a woman after my workshop came up there's a whole bunch of people uh because once people know that you are uh supportive of experiencers and that you know about experiencers i was inundated with these experiencers after my workshop and one of the women hands me her phone and she said look what i got and she said i'm a secretary and i got this 25 page scientific download and it had formulas and all this kind of stuff and she said she mentioned some scientist who had checked it and said it made sense or whatever and i said can you please send me this can you uh because i'd heard about these stories before there's a couple of these stories of these 25 27 page downloads that these people suddenly they they're just sitting there and they're writing this stuff out and uh, she promised she would but she never did so you get this kind of stuff where people are um getting um uh virus i know a guy i can't out the guy but i know who he is he's at a university in texas uh got a download on how to kill a vi- how to kill viruses uh whether it's the aids virus or the cold virus and what it does is it encapsulates the virus and he's there's no ifs ands or buts he's telling me uh this research doctor it came from aliens he told me about his alien experiences his daughter actually helps me run an exp- my experiencer group here in Winnipeg, and she's a medical trained doctor. And uh, so you get these guys. Uh, I have a guy, a former NASA engineer, who put an experiment. Again, I can't out the guy, but uh, put an experiment on the space shuttle. And a uh, very dramatic experiment. And they said, no, we're not putting this on here. This is garbage. It's never going to work. And he, he got this idea, this download. And uh, finally, he got some scientists to sign off on it. They put it on the space shuttle, and it worked. And he sold his company for a uh, reported $100 million, he and his partner. And he told me, he said, Grant, that idea came in my head that morning. The last thing I remember that night was a hooded figure standing at the end of my bed. So this is, I think, very important. I mean, I, and this is what I'm going to talk about at the Experiencer uh, Conference in uh, Maine. I'm going to talk about these downloads and dramatic stuff like cures to cancer. Uh, and so the, the, whole, the whole point is, what do you do if you get this kind of stuff? To me, it's much more important than chasing sightings. It's much more important than what the, what the government knows or whether they're going to tell us or whatever. Uh, these people have got material that they're being given, and I think we should try to figure out why they're being given this material. And is anything that they have of legitimate benefit? Wow! Because uh, I, yeah, because I mentioned that I mentioned that one with Brett Oldham. I don't know if you're going to go to the break or we can. Uh, yeah, we're going to tell- go, we're going to go with the break. And I hope you don't take offense at this. But did you have a double latte before the show? 
<laughs> yes, I talk fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll get used to it. That's fine. Uh, we, I, I love getting a lot of information, so this would be great. But, no, we're, we'll take a, a, a break in, in just a, a minute here. I wanted to say to the live listener out there, um, you can jump over to the chat room, which is at podcastufo.com. And also, um, this is a call-in show if you'd like to call in. Some people do every once in a while. That's 603-967-4030. So, Grant, just before we take a quick break here, um, are you taking a little bit of a break from you are known for the president's UFOs. Are you still active in that? And if so, we can talk about it in the second hour. I just wanted to ask that quick question. Well, I, I, I still follow it. I don't think it's as, as important as experience stuff, but I, I do follow it. And I do have my book is back in, in line. I have a presidential UFO book that was supposed to come out about 10 years ago, uh, was contracted in New York. It never did come out. Uh, but it's back on track again, and we may be going with it. Oh, great. <clears throat> Do you have a working title for that book? Uh, it was Presidents and UFOs, but somebody else did the, just put out a book with the same title. Uh, <laughs> I think I saw so that. So it's going to be different, but it's, uh, it's basically going to have UFO in the title, and, and it's uh, the stories of the presidents, but it, uh, it'll, it, it'll move. It's, it's very interesting stuff with the presidents knowing who have seen UFOs and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's extremely interesting stuff. Yeah, I'd really like to talk about that a little sure. bit in the second hour. Okay, so hang on. Uh, and the podcast listener, if you want to listen to the entire show, you can support the show for only a dollar a month or more right on our website. You can see that at podcastufo.com. Just to let you know, the support does really help. Like, for instance, last week when I was down to Ray Stanford's down in Maryland, that was all out of pocket, um, you know, three nights in a hotel, all that stuff. So it really does help. As a matter of fact, I'd love to do more shows on the road like that. Um, so next week we have Richard Souter on. He's going to be talking about his book. I want to thank everyone for helping out tonight. Our guests, of course, our two guests, it is, Gerard Artson and Grant Cameron. And I also want to thank uh, Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for the music, Peggy for managing the Facebook page. Remember, you can like us on Facebook for all the latest UFO news. And that'll do it. So we'll see you next week right here on the Dark Matter Digital Network or if you're listening on the podcast at podcastufo.com. Thanks a lot and keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>